If I were to give today's sermon a title, it would simply be Stay Woke. Stay Woke, Stay Woke. Remember earlier I told you all, if you aspire to preach, be very careful what you name your sermons. I was settling on another name when the Lord sparked my creativity to go with this title, Stay Woke. If I had known what was going to happen after I named this sermon, I probably would have gone with my gut and named it what I initially intended to name it because Pastor Mike got zero sleep last night. <laughs> Every maybe 10 minutes, I was just awakened. I would look at my phone and I would be mad because I realized only 10 minutes had gone and I would try to doze back off to sleep. And the moment it got good to me, I would wake up again and realize only a good 10 minutes had passed. This continued all night. But nevertheless, the sermon is entitled Stay Woke. Um, for those of you who uh, keep your ears to the street, those of you who are in tune with what's going on with this generation, one of the things I talked about on last week is how I love how vibrant our vocabulary is in this generation. We come up with catchphrases and sayings that are just uh, uh, immaculate. So just amazing. I love how this generation expresses themselves. And, 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 and one of these sayings that we say in this generation is what I just named this sermon. Somebody say, stay woke. stay woke. I can't tell you when exactly stay woke came about, but I do know round about the time period. Stay woke. Uh, if you go to the Urban Dictionary, it will tell you that it is an awareness that 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 to stay woke is to realize that there's more to see than what they're showing you. Stay woke is challenging us not to just see what's on the line, but to read between the lines. And, and, and this term of stay woke came about uh, as young brothers of color and sisters of color found themselves the victims of American injustice, specifically at the hands of police brutality. Uh, as these brothers were being gunned down on video footage, but arguments were coming out uh, that things were not what they seen. I know what you see on the camera, but but what you're seeing on the camera really isn't what you're seeing, that, that there's something going on behind the scenes. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me how media tries to show us certain things and convince us of certain things when we really know the truth. And so this term of stay woke came about during this time telling folks, listen, don't believe the hype. I, I don't believe what you see on social media. Don't believe what they're reporting on the news. There is more to be seen than what they're showing you. Now, some of you are saying, Pastor Mike, what in the world does stay woke have to do with uh, uh, Luke chapter nine, uh, beginning at verse 28 through 36? Well, uh, Jesus is revealing something to his disciples. What he's revealing is himself. He's revealing his glory to them. Now, that's amazing to me because they've been following Jesus for almost three years now. But this is the first time they're seeing it. And, and, and not everyone is seeing it. Jesus specifically chose three of his disciples, Peter, James and John. They've become known as the inner circle for Jesus. Now, Jesus has 12 disciples, but 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 these three are special. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know why they're so special, because every time he chooses them, they sleep in. Think about it. This is not the only time this happens. But when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and the Bible says that he's about to be crucified and, and he's praying all night and sweat is literally dropping off him uh, like blood. These disciples, these three were sleeping. Which is amazing to me because what that tells me is that my closeness to God is not based upon my performance before him. Amen. That that I can be close to God and still have a little ratchetness in me. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to be ratchet uh, uh, and just give God anything. But what I'm saying is your closeness to God is not dependent upon how good you are. It's not dependent upon how much you pray. It's not dependent upon uh, how many uh, Bible verses you have uh, stored in your memory. But sometimes God just chooses you. Yeah. And he chooses these three for this moment. He wants to reveal something to them. But what's interesting is they're not even 100 percent ready for what he's revealing. So Jesus is manifesting his glory. He's showing them that there's more to me than what you've seen. And I'm not going to show this to everybody. Now, he gets them up on this mountain and the Bible says he's praying. And while Jesus is praying, they fall asleep. 
Now, they don't, they don't just fall asleep, but the text says it's a deep sleep. And if you've ever tried to pray late at night, you know, if you really want to go to sleep, start praying. Yeah. <laughs> you will find yourself in borderline coma if you are not careful. They find themselves in a deep sleep. But what's interesting is the moment that Jesus begins to reveal, the text says they become fully awake. They go from being in a deep sleep to fully awake. I want to share with you on today that many of us are in a deep sleep and have been in a deep sleep because we don't know how to handle revelation responsibly. Yeah. Yeah. That God gives revelation and our inability to properly handle the revelation that he's given us has caused some of us to find ourselves in stagnation. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been shown something by God, but you found yourself stuck where you are, unable to get to what it is he showed you? Mm -hmm. Well, I would argue that that's because you have not quite come to the place where you know how to properly uh, handle the revelation that God has given you. And so I want to share with you today three ways, uh, and I'm going to pull them from this text, three ways to handle revelation responsibly. If you're taking notes, you can put that as your header. We love to take notes around here. Uh, but three ways to handle revelation responsibly. Now, before I can actually get into that, I need to lay some, some groundwork. Can I lay a little groundwork uh, this morning? Y'all don't sound convincing. Can I lay a little groundwork this morning? Yes. Amen. I should have bought everybody coffee this morning. That seven o'clock is really hurting y'all. <laughs> um, but, but before we can get into these three ways to handle revelation responsibly, we need to come to the conclusion of why revelation is so responsible, uh, why revelation is so important, excuse me. And we see that in verse 32. It says, uh, Peter and those with him were in a deep sleep. And when they became fully awake, somebody say fully awake. They saw his glory in the two men who were standing with him. Now, again, what is Jesus showing them? Jesus is showing them himself. He's revealing a part of himself that he, to this point, had not revealed to him. And so what Jesus is showing them is correction. So the first reason revelation is so important, so good to see the butlers this morning. The reason uh, revelation is so important is because with revelation comes correction. That you have not truly seen the world as it is until you've gotten revelation from God. That you have not seen your marriage as it truly is until you've received revelation from God. That you have not seen yourself as you truly are until you've had revelation from God. That you have not even experienced church as church can be experienced until you have revelation from God. Uh, one song said it this way, I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. Revelation has this correcting ability uh, for those of us who are visually impaired, which means we we got a little help when it comes to seeing. Uh, uh, you know that when you go to the optometrist uh, that they sit you in a chair and, and a certain amount of feet away from that chair is a chart that has letters on it. Now, no matter how hard you look at that chart, if you are visually impaired, you can't see nothing. Now, they're going to ask you to read as many lines as possible, but, 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 but you eventually find yourself at a point where there's a line that you can't read. Now, if you ain't doing so bad, you can make it to them last two lines. But if you really jacked up, my God, you might not make it past the first one, which is that big E. And what happens is, again, you can you're looking at the chart, but you can't see the chart. And it's only when the optometrist moves this particular uh, 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 device in front of your eyes and begins to make adjustments that you finally see what you've been looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the revelations here that these men have been walking with Jesus for almost three years. They've been looking at him, but they've never seen him. My God. Mm -hmm. Might I argue that after I leave today and after we leave today, you may want to check your circle out because it's very possible that there are people who are looking at you, but have never seen you. Yeah, yeah th th this is why people can take you for granted because they've been looking at you, yeah. but they don't see you. This is why folks think they can just walk out of your life and feel like they're not losing anything because they are looking at you, but but they've never seen you. And these men have ate with Jesus. They have worshiped with Jesus. They have prayed with Jesus. They have followed Jesus. They've been looking at him, but they've never seen him. And so revelation gives us the ability to see correctly. Might I argue that we are living in a world where things are not what they seem. 
that it looks one way, but when God gives you revelation, and, and this is something I shared this morning, when God gives you re uh, revelation, you can't unsee what he's shown you. Some of us who are preachers understand we wish we could unsee some of the things that God has shown us because the truth of the matter is we now see things as they are. Mm -hmm. And might I argue that one of the hardest things to do is to see things as they really are. Mm -hmm. Some of you will never know the heartbreak of seeing a person as they really are. Yeah. There's an old saying in this world that ignorance is, is bliss. And some of us are only as happy as we are because we don't know everything that we should know. Yeah. When God gives you revelation, you can't unsee what you've seen because now you're seeing it correctly. But not only is there correction, but there's connection. Yeah. The text says not only do they see Jesus in his glory, but Moses and Elijah show up. Now, when you are a true Bible scholar and, and Bible student, uh, you understand that everything has, has a symbolism to it, that there's nothing going on in the Bible just for the sake of going on. If a piece of grass grows in the Bible, there's a reason the grass grew. And so looking at this text, we're not just seeing two dead men show up, but we're seeing two symbols. Anybody could have come into this moment, but specifically Moses and Elijah come into this moment. Now, you should be asking yourself, Pastor Mike, why did Moses and Elijah come up? Well, since you won't ask out loud, I'll just ask for you. The reason that Moses and Elijah show up because they symbolize something. Moses symbolizes the law. Elijah symbolizes the prophets. Now, what you have to understand is that collection of 66 books that you have called the B-I-B-L-E was not always in existence. And during this time, what we know as the Bible was simply comprised of the law and the prophets. So watch this. Jesus is here. And he reveals him true self. And when he reveals him true self, the law and the prophets show up. What's happening here? A connection is being made. Uh, this is why Jesus says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You thought you had eternal life in Moses. You thought you had eternal life in Elijah. You thought it was the law that gave you eternal life. You thought it was the word of the prophets that brought you eternal life. But now that I'm on the scene, uh, 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 I am the fulfillment of what Moses gave you. I am the fulfillment of what the prophet spoke. It's, there's a reason that they're showing up. I'm drawing a connection. And when you have revelation from God, thank you, Holy Spirit. When you have revelation from God, you don't just read the Bible any kind of way. When you got revelation from God, uh, uh, you start connecting some things. Uh, when you read the Bible as it really is, you understand that Jesus is from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, Jesus don't just show up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, 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 Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, but Jesus was there in the beginning. Uh, that when God began to speak, the Bible says in the beginning was the word of God. Uh, 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 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Nothing was done without the word. So every time God said, let there be, that's Jesus saying hello. Uh, when you know, uh, uh, when you have revelation from God and you're reading the Bible, you understand that the law that was given, when you see the scapegoat that they put all, they uh, covered and said all of their sins over this goat and released them to the wild, you understand that that's Jesus, the man who came to take away the sins of the world. That same scapegoat that we put our sins on and sent into the wilderness, Jesus bore our sins on the cross and said, you don't have to carry this, baby. I will carry this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You don't have to bear that burden alone. Season saints say it this way. He's a burden bearing God. Yes. You understand when you have revelation that you read the Bible and you see the lamb that was slain, the unblemished lamb that was slain when they cut his neck. That was symbolic of Jesus. That was Jesus yet waving again that I have no flaws. I have no issues. I have no sins, but I'm willing to get my throat cut for you. Your throat should be getting cut. Ah, but I am the lamb that takes away the sins of the world and you don't have to die your own death. I'll die it for you. When you have revelation from the Lord. You don't just read the Bible. You don't just skim the pages, but you begin to do what I did in my childhood. Uh, when I was growing up, we had these books, these coloring books, and every so often in the coloring book, they would have this picture where you could see a piece of it, but then there were just a bunch of numbered dots all over the page. And, and what you would have to do is you would have to start at dot one, and you would have to go to two, three, four, five, six, seven, and, and the more you began to draw a line 
line to these dots, the picture started to get clearer. Can I help somebody? Uh, revelation is important because revelation connects the dot. Some of you got to go back to your childhood days and break out your crayons. God is giving you revelation because he's trying to connect the dots. Some of you are saying, God, you've shown me this vision and I don't know what to do with it. And God is saying, baby, I need you to connect the dots. I need you to hear what I'm saying. I need you to connect with me. And when you connect with me, I'll show you how to connect the dots. That relationship is the relationship that's going to lead to the relationship you've been praying for. Uh, this connection here here is going to lead to the job that you've been praying for. Mm -hmm. Don't throw that person away just yet because they are a numbered dot that I am connecting to get you to your destiny. Uh, revelation is about correction, Preach, but it's man. also about connection. Preach, I'm yeah. trying. So now that we understand why revelation is so important, can I show you how to handle revelation? Yeah. Because what we're going to see in this text are the disciples of Jesus trusted with this powerful revelation that they really don't know how to handle. The first way we handle revelation responsibly is we get up. Somebody say get up. Yeah. We, 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 we get up. The text says in verse 33, uh, as the two men were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Somebody say here. Here. Let's set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he was saying. He says, it's good for us to be here. It's good for us to be on this mountain. It's good for us to be in this moment. He says, it's good for us to be here. Um, that's interesting to me uh, 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 because Peter says it's good for us to be here. In essence, what Peter is saying is that there's nowhere else we should be in this moment. In other words, Peter is saying that it does not get any better than what's happening right now. Peter does not know what he's saying because he does not know who's actually being revealed in front of him. Peter says it's good to be here. Can I give you a thought real quick? Uh, revelation is not just informational, it's invitational. Mm. Can I say that one more time? A uh, 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 revelation is not just informational. It's invitational. Okay, y'all need some help. Say, Pastor Mike, help us. Okay, when God gives you revelation, he's not just uh, 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 telling you something for knowledge purposes. But when God gives you revelation, he's inviting you into something greater. Okay, uh, 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 y'all don't read your Bible, so let, let me help you out. So the verse of scripture that we just read, if you remember at the top of it, it says, and eight days after this conversation. Now, again, when you read the Bible and you got revelation, you start asking questions. Yeah. Because if it says eight days after this com uh, after this conversation, the first thing I should be asking is, well, what was the conversation? Yeah, well, right. if you go up a couple of verses, uh, what's happening in that particular conversation, uh, Jesus says, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself, yeah. take up his cross and follow me. He begins to lay a framework of what it is to actually follow him, yeah. that you can't be all nonchalant when you following me, that when you follow me, it's going to cost you something, yes, that when you follow me, you're going to go through some hurts. That when you follow me, it's going to uh, cost you some relationships. It's going to cost you some frustration. It's going to cost you some disappointment. And watch this. You may even die in the process. Uh, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself, which means if you're going to follow me, you got to stop thinking about yourself. If you're going to follow me, you can't be taking stuff personal because not everything is personal. Some things are purposeful. Some folks are hurting you not because you did anything to them. Uh, it's just that they can't handle your why. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, this is what it takes. This is the conversation that he has. And after he has this conversation, don't miss this, with 12 disciples, he takes three disciples into the mountain. Yeah. What am I saying? Many are called, but few are chosen. Yeah, yeah everybody gets uh, what he says, but not everybody gets invited. Because for, uh, for nine of them, this was informational. But for three of them, they understood it's invitational. Uh, God says, listen, I'm not just showing you who I am just to show you who I am. I'm showing you who I am because I'm inviting you to a deeper walk with me. Be careful what you say. Some of you come in church and you're saying songs like, come by here, Lord, and just a closer walk with thee. If you knew 
what it costs to walk with the Lord, you would be very careful what you say out your mouth. If you knew what was required to really walk with Jesus, you'd be careful what you said out of your mouth. Because when we uh, uh, walk in revelation, we're not just getting information, but it's an invitation into someplace deeper. He says, listen, if you're going to follow me, you can't just look at me. You got to see me. Amen. And you got to see me clearly. Amen. Revelation is not just informational. It's invitational. So whenever God shows you something, your response should be, OK, God, where are we going? Mm -hmm. That if God shows you something about your marriage, you should say, God, where are we going? That when God shows you something about your future, you should say, God, where are we going? Mm -hmm. And the problem is many of us, we get the vision. We take the information, but we miss the invitation. Mm -hmm. Peter decides that he wants to stay in this place. And might I argue that the reason some of us are not seeing the manifestation of our revelation is because we're living in our last revelation. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, that God is a God of movement, and I'm not going to get ahead of myself too quick here, but God is a God of movement, but we're stuck in the moment. Mm -hmm. Peter says, I want to set up three shelters. He says, it's good for us to be here, and I want to set up three shelters. Now, what are these three shelters? These are the, what they call tent of meetings. These are the booths. This is an Old Testament view. Now, again, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. They've just seen the revelation of the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And the first response is to go back to the law. He says, let's build tabernacles here. In other words, let's set up three churches. We're going to set up a church of Jesus. We're going to set up a church of Moses. And we're going to set up a church of Elijah. In other words, uh, let's implement religion in this moment of relationship. Mm -hmm. Don't miss that. Jesus has bared himself to them. He says, listen, I'm welcoming you into this, uh, 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 this, 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 this intimate relationship with me. And the response to this invitation to intimate relationship is religion. Mm -hmm. Might I argue that the reason our churches are stagnant is because we've missed the invitation for relationship. Because we're holding too fast to religion. That because we've always done it this way, we're missing, behold, I do a new thing, shall you not know? They look at this invitation. Peter looks at this invitation and he says, let's go back to doing things the way we did it. Which brings me to another thought. Revelation is not an invitation to move in. It's an invitation to move on. Yeah. Revelation is not an invitation to move in. It's an invitation to move on. And the problem is some of us, God has exposed something to us. He has revealed something to us. And in the thing he revealed to us, we started unpacking ourselves in that thing, not realizing that God was not inviting us to move in, but to move on. That God was showing us a glimpse of not what needs to be, but what's to come. And Peter has messed himself up. And this is why the text says he didn't know what he was saying because he was living in his last revelation. Isn't it amazing that God can be revealing something new, but we're stuck in the old? Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me that God could be showing us a better way, but we're still stuck in the familiar way. My God. That God can show us blessings that we've been praying for, but we're still holding on to things that we just inherited. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, look at your neighbor say neighbor yeah. are you living in your last revelation yeah. God is trying to do something new but, but have you unpacked all of yourself in this moment here instead of what it is God is trying to do N not only that but uh, in verse 31 the text says Moses and Elijah show up and they're talking to Jesus don't miss what the conversation was about they're talking to Jesus about leaving don't, don't miss this. Uh, 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 Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about leaving. And Peter says, let's stay here. Moses and Elijah saying, let's go. Peter says, let's stay here. One more time for the Holy Ghost. Uh, 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 Moses and Elijah are dead. They come back into this moment 
and they say, uh, uh, you about to be on your way out of here. Now, many theologians look at this scripture and what they suggest is that Jesus began to feel the weight of the moment, that he was beginning to feel what was actually about to come. And Jesus, because he was in, in flesh, began to have second thoughts about this thing. And he's like, listen, God, I don't even like all these folks like that. Truth of the matter is, I love them. But for real, they tripping, tripping. You seen how they've been treating me? The Pharisees question me everywhere I go. I perform miracles. Matter of fact, I went to my own hometown. Folks that watched me grow up and the, I couldn't even do a whole bunch of miracles because they couldn't believe that I was capable of doing it. They were some haters. God, are you sure I need to die for these folks? And the Bible says that Moses and Elijah come back uh, because they're encouraging Jesus. They're telling him, stick with it. Go through it. Because watch this, the glory that you reveal does not compare to the glory that's to come. Mm -hmm. Don't miss that. Even the strong need encouragement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, even those of us who have a savior-like complex need to be saved from time to time. Yeah. And Jesus had a moment where he needed Moses and Elijah, these central figures, to come and say, listen, we mean nothing without you. Yeah. That if you don't do what you do, what we did won't matter. And so Jesus gets a word and they're talking about him leaving. But Peter says, let's stay here. Which brings me to my third thought. Many of us miss the movement because we're married to the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Many of us miss the movement because we're married to the moment. Uh, this is a movement that's happening. This is a moment that's fleeting. This is something that was supposed to be temporary. But Peter is ready to unpack everything in this place. He's ready to make something that was temporary permanent. And many of us, we see something good that God has shown us. And it's a temporary thing, but we make it permanent because watch this. We limit what God can do. Can I help you? You have yet to see the best God can do. And don't get me wrong. I know God has blown your mind. I know God has uh, uh, blessed you out your socks. Uh, as Dr. Washington would say, bless me out my Gucci boots. I, I know God has done some extraordinary things in your life. But can I tell you that your best days are not in front of you or uh, behind you? Your best days are ahead of you. That the Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither have you even imagined. I love the fact that I serve a God who still has stuff for me that I can't even imagine, although I've seen what he can do. Yeah. Peter mishandles the moment because he thinks it does not get any better than this. And therefore, he puts a limit on God. Can I help you? The reason some of us don't see the, uh, the manifestation of God's revelation is because we've limited his ability to the last revelation. Mm -hmm. That there's nothing beyond this moment. And if you're not careful, you will miss the movement if you marry the moment. Uh, if you got a parent like mine, they, they always told you, be careful who you marry. Mm -hmm. I heard a comedian say it this way. Some of us married on the level we should have been moving on. Yeah. Oh, wow. And now we found ourselves stuck in a place because we were so excited by the moment right. that we missed the movement. Right. That we, 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 we married the mile marker, yeah. that this was just something to tell us that we're on the right path, but we got stuck at the marker. Right. My God. See if I can make this plain. Um, right. There was a brother who had just started a job and it seems like he really wasn't getting along with his coworkers. And one day he was at the water cooler and one of the coworkers came up to him and said, hey, me and some of the guys are meeting at the bar, this particular bar at five o'clock. And he walked away. The gentleman worked the rest of his shift, went home, waited for his wife to come home. His wife comes home. She busts through the door and he says, hey, honey, uh, 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 one of the brothers told me that they're meeting up at the bar at this particular time. His wife looked at her watch and said, well, what, what are you doing here? You missed it. They said we're going to be here at a particular time. And he went home, he waited for his wife to come home, and he said, honey, the guys at work told me that they're going to meet here at a particular time. His wife looked at her watch and said, well, honey, what are you still doing here? In other words, the brother got so excited about the invitation that he missed the invitation. Watch this. Many of us receive a revelation from God and we get so excited about the revelation that we miss the invitation. In other words, we get so excited about what God showed us that we never actually start to put in the work to manifest what he showed us. See, God has shown some of us that our future is better, but we miss the invitation. We get so excited and we danced about it in church. We rolled on the floor. We spoke in tongues, but then we got up 
we celebrated, but we never did anything about it. Uh, uh, we called up our neighbor and we told them that better things were on the way, but we did not position ourselves for the better thing. Uh, uh, we high-fived our neighbors, turned around three times, but then we did not do what was necessary for what he showed us. Okay, God showed you that you're about to get married. What are you doing to prepare? God showed you that a new job is on the way. Have you tweaked your resume? God showed you that you're about to get a new car. Um, have you started preparing yourself for the payments that come with it? God is calling us. I told you this is a year of increase. God is calling us, and he's not just giving us more, but he's requiring more from us. Somebody say, I got to step my faith up in 2022. So it's not enough for me to celebrate on what he showed me. I got to start doing something to, uh, to, to show that I truly believe what he showed me. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which means I'm not moving based on what I see. I'm moving based based on what was revealed. Yes. The brother got so excited about the information that he missed the invitation. And many of us have spent years going from church to church to church, getting information and missing the invitation. I refuse to be a preacher that tells you God's going to do this, do that, do this, do that and let you walk away without strategy. Yes. I refuse to be a preacher that tells you to spin around three times and it's gonna happen, that ain't Bible. Mm -hmm. I refuse to be a preacher that gets you excited about the information, but I don't equip you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. Peter gets this revelation, but he wants to stay where he is. The way we handle revelation responsibly is that we get up. That after God shows us something, we then say, okay, God, now where? Where do I go? What do I do? Who do I talk to? Not only do we get up, but after we get up, we listen up. After we get up, we listen up. The text says, while he was saying this, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them. They became afraid, and as they entered the cloud, uh, oh, excuse me, they became afraid as they entered the cloud, and then a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son, the chosen one, listen to him. Don't miss that last part. Then a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. Somebody say, listen to him. Listen to him. So Jesus has just revealed his glory. He has just shown a, a, a side of himself that though they've been with him for three years, he's just now showing them in this moment. And he's not showing it to everybody. He's showing it to these chosen three. And after he shows himself, a voice comes from heaven and says, this is my son. This is the chosen one. Listen to him. Uh, uh, God the Father speaks as he also did at the baptism uh, of Jesus, and he tells them what to do now that Jesus' glory has been revealed. In other words, he does not just give them information, but he then gives them instruction. Mm -hmm. He does not just allow them to see what's to come. He then says, now wait for the instruction. Mm -hmm. He does not just get them happy about the moment. He says, wait a moment. Yeah. Instruction is coming. I know you've seen something that you've never seen before. I know I've shown you owning a business. I know I've shown you in a okay. successful marriage. I know I've shown you running a ministry. I, I know I've shown you run, uh, running a Fortune 500 company. I know I've shown you making an impact in your community. Uh, but make sure you wait for the instruction. Yeah. Yeah. He says, I've shown you things you can't even imagine. But you got to have instruction, which brings me to my next thought. When we devalue instruction, we delay manifestation. Mm. When we devalue instruction, we delay manifestation. Can I help some of you who are saying, Pastor Mike, God showed me this, but I've yet to see it. Did you wait for the instructions? Mm. I've been praying about this thing, but nothing's happening. Did you wait for the instructions? I want you to think back to your last revelation of God. And ask yourself, what were my instructions? Did I get so happy doing cartwheels down the aisle that I missed my instructions? Did I get so happy and got on the phone and told everybody about it that I missed my instructions? Uh, did I get so hype about it and run to work and tell everybody that I knew and forgot the instructions? When we devalue instruction, we delay manifestation. And this is why after God, uh, uh, Jesus reveals his glory, God has to remind them, listen, uh, don't go to putting stuff together just yet. Wait for the instructions. Uh, most of us men can attest we don't like instructions. Yes, Lord. 
Okay, if you're anything like me, and, and I'll just take one for the team, if you're anything like me, uh, you buy something, and you don't look at the manual, you look at the picture. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you th if you're really bold, you throw the manual away, and you just look at the picture. I ain't got that bold yet. Uh, but you just look at the picture because you've assumed in your mind that because I've seen the end of it, I know how to get there. Right, right. This is why brothers also don't take directions too well. Now, me, I rely heavily on my GPS because if I had to go by my own instruction, I'd be in trouble. Uh, 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 but men, we inherently look at a situation. And, and if I can just see the picture, mm -hmm. I believe I can put it together. I remember I bought something simple. It was a, 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 a housing unit for my water hose because I'm a homeowner now and, you know, you got to have a water hose and you got a water hose, you got to protect it. And so I get this housing unit for my water hose. It's a very simple piece of machinery. It's composed of maybe three pieces, but I, for my life, could not get these three pieces together. I'm looking at the picture and I'm, I'm moving stuff and I'm, 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 I'm putting stuff here and putting stuff there and I'm looking at the picture and I see how it should look, but I'm looking at what I got and it ain't quite adding up. And, and, and I'm gonna be honest with, uh, with y'all and myself, I, I know I was outside for at least two hours. <laughs> three pieces and I'm outside for two hours. I'm looking at the picture and I'm looking at the product and finally, I grab the manual and I read the instructions. And this is why instruction is important, yes, because I realized that there were different models. See, the instructions told me that depending on the model you got would determine how the pieces go together. Right. Mm -hmm. Same three pieces. But if depending on the model, they belong in a different order. Mm -hmm. And if I had read the instructions, on, I would not have delayed the manifestation. I could have been in the house in the AC soon. And some of us are frustrated because God showed us something. And we're saying, God, I see what you showed me. And, and, and I'm out here running and I'm out here buying stuff and I'm out here telling folks about it. And I'm getting people excited about it. But God, I'm not seeing nothing. And God is saying, did you get my instructions? Mm -hmm. Because watch this, just because you watch someone else do it, they may not have the same model. Yeah. <laughs> and what worked for them may not work for you. Yeah. This is why I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, all these self-help books are great. But think about it. They're writing to you how they help themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm not you, will it work for me? Yeah. <laughs> I hate to be this guy. But many of you, especially if you follow social media, uh, you know that Megan Good and, and Devon Franklin yeah. have filed for divorce. Mm. How many millions of people went out to buy their marriage book when it dropped when they first got married? Did y'all wait on instructions? Because clearly what they said worked for them didn't work for them. We have to be careful of looking at the picture and not seeking God for instruction. God has shown some of you some amazing things, but you're not walking in it. Yes, because you didn't wait for the instructions. Mm -hmm. Next time you find yourself at a conference and somebody prophesy to you, you're going to get this. Make sure you wait till service is over and catch them at the door and say, did God give you my instructions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because don't get me excited about what God's going to do and leave me to figure it out by myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. He says, you got to get up. You got to listen up. Not only do you listen up, this last one going to stay. After we get up and after we listen up, we got to shut up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because I don't want your neighbor mad at me, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, <laughs> shut up. Uh, it's okay. Um, some of you saying, Pastor Mike, you got to show me that in the text. The text says, verse 36, uh, after the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. Mm -hmm. They kept silent yeah. and at that time told no one what they had seen. Mm -hmm. They kept silent, mm -hmm. comma, mm -hmm. and at that time mm -hmm. told no one. Mm -hmm. They kept silent, comma, mm -hmm. and at that time told no one which suggests that there came a time mm -hmm. for them to tell someone, right. mm -hmm. but they understood that this ain't the time right. yeah. to tell no one. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some of y'all just be telling folks shut up all day. My pastor told me to tell you to shut up. So send my pastor an email. Don't fuss at me. Uh, <laughs> they kept silent and at that time told no one. Which means just because God revealed it doesn't mean you should release it. Right. Just because God revealed it doesn't mean you should release it. Whether that's for you or someone else. Because many times God will reveal something to you about somebody else. But that don't mean he wants you to tell them. Yeah, uh, we have to be like the sons of Issachar, able to discern the times and the seasons. And just because God revealed it to me doesn't mean that it's the time to release it. And if the disciples got anything right, they got that right. They missed the first two. But they caught this one, that if Jesus only invited us to see this, then maybe he don't want everybody to know this. In other words, if God wanted you to know, he would have invited you. He brings them into this moment, but he only calls three of them and he shows them something that he has not shown anyone else. And after they see it, now, mind you. If it was me, I'm going to just be honest. Um, I would have been hyped and I would have came down the mountain like, listen, man. Um, if you had seen what Joe, Jesus showed me on the mountain. I'm, listen, I'm a super apostle now. I, I don't know what you heard. You could ask about that. No, nah, no, nah, I don't do that no more. Y'all do that. I, he took me to the mountain and he showed me something. So I, I'm good now. I'm off that. You can you can keep that. Oh, can I tell you what? I'm going to tell you what Jesus showed me. Watch this. He peeled all his glory back. Yeah, we saw it all. It was I was blinded by it. I just I couldn't even see it all. It was just an amazing thing. They come down the mountain and they say nothing because they understand that just because he rele uh, just because he revealed it doesn't mean we should release it. But this also brings me to another thought. And this is where some of us are right now. Some of our greatest frustration and opposition comes from trying to make others see what God never showed them. Some of our greatest frustration and opposition comes from trying to make others see what God didn't show them. Okay, um, there are some folks mad at you right now because you told them what God showed you. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, they, they're not just haters, they aren't. I, I know you've written them off as haters. The problem is they can't see what God showed you. And so they're frustrated because you've now put them in a position to try to see something that was never meant for their eyes. OK, uh, uh, some of you have lost great friends because you shared an idea with them that God never wanted you to share with them. See, be careful not to allow familiarity to mess up your future. See, just because you're with me in this season doesn't mean you're going to work with me in the next. Just because you have something to offer to me now doesn't mean you have anything to offer to my future. Somebody say it ain't personal. It's purposeful. God shows them something that's not for everyone. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves frustrated because we're trying to communicate something to someone whose mind has not been conditioned to receive it. See, the only reason they can receive it is because Jesus invited them into the moment. There are some things you don't see until the moment. Have you ever been looking for something and no matter where you look, you just can't find it? And then you go right back to the place that you already look and you find it? That's revelation. In other words, it was always there, but it just wasn't the time for me to see it. Uh, 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 there are certain things about folk, no matter what you tell a person, until the time comes for them to see it, they just won't see it. This is why I sleep real good at night. Because folks will call me, Pastor Mike, I need advice about this. And I want to just tell them, it's this. But I know that if I tell them it's this, they're going to stop being mad at them. And they're going to be mad at me. The devil is a lie. I'm just going to keep bringing you around to this place that you keep overlooking until you finally see it. 
Just because he uh, revealed it doesn't mean it's time to release it. I think one of the best examples we see about this, and I'm going to challenge some of your theology on this. One of the best examples we see in the Bible of this is Joseph. God shows Joseph two visions. He shows him a vision uh, that involves his brothers bowing before him. Then he shows him another vision that involves his parents and his brothers bowing before him. Nowhere in the text do we see that Joseph prayed after the vision. Joseph gets the vision and runs straight to the people who were in the vision and starts telling them what's in the vision. And how do they respond to the vision? He gets rebuked by his parents and he gets thrown in the ditch by his brothers. Joseph's greatest opposition came because he tried to make his family see what God never showed them. Now watch this. I believe, just my two cents, I believe that if Joseph had shut up, he still would have found himself in Egypt, he still would have found himself as vice president to Pharaoh, but it would have been an easier path there. Here's why I love God so much. Joseph opens his mouth, finds himself in a situation where people are opposed to what he's seen. He gets, he gets thrown into a ditch, finds himself in Potiphar's house, gets in a whole bunch of mess in Potiphar's house, finds himself in prison, uh, gets forgotten about in prison, but then finds himself, himself in the palace and ends up right in the place he said he would be, which is with his brothers and his family submitting to his authority. Mm -hmm. What am I saying? There's always more than one way to get to what God has for you. Amen. The problem is, depending on how you respond to the revelation will determine the road you take to the revelation. Oh, yes, and Joseph has found himself taking the hard road because he wouldn't shut up. Mm -hmm. Can I help some of y'all? Yes, some of y'all to put gray hairs on your head. Yes, Lord. Because God showed you something. You said something. Mm -hmm. Bishop said, I didn't lost mine. <laughs> he showed you something. You said something to the wrong people, and then you found yourself with opposition yeah. because they don't see what God showed you. Yeah. Can, can I set somebody free today? Yes. Save your breath yeah. from trying to make people see what God didn't show them. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 keep, save yourself a lot of high blood pressure pill money yeah. trying to show people what God never showed them. If God showed you, your response should be, God, where? Uh, uh, and God, do I release it now? And some of us, watch this, have gotten embarrassed because God gave us revelation and we released it without instruction. And now folks are saying, well, where is it? And we looking crazy. We have to be careful to handle revelation properly. And I believe that in this year, God is going to start dropping revelation uh, like we've never imagined. We're going to start seeing things that look impossible, but we serve a God who makes all things possible. But we have to be responsible with the revelation. Can I convict somebody? Some of you used to dream and you don't dream anymore. And the reason you don't dream anymore is because you weren't responsible with the revelation. Some of you used to hear a lot more and you're not hearing like you used to hear mm -hmm. because you haven't been responsible with the revelation. Mm -hmm. Some of you are visionaries. You can look at a thing and you don't see it as it is. You see it as it could be. And that gift has stopped yes, because God is saying you haven't been responsible with the revelation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I've shown you things, but you married the moment mm -hmm. and you missed the movement. Mm -hmm. The Bible says to everything there's a season, a time, and a purpose. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we yes. dealt with this a little bit this morning. I ain't going to put that person on blast. But, but one of the greatest lies the enemy tells us is that we have time. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You don't have time. And watch this. If we'll be honest, for some of us, that same time is money is true. Because the same way our bank account is in overdraft, our sense of time is in overdraft. Mm -hmm. Many of us are spending hours that God hasn't given to us yeah. because the enemy has told us you got time. Yeah. And many of us, if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves with our work undone yeah. because we spent yesterday's hours on today's assignment. Mm -hmm. We have to get to a place where when God shows us something that we say, God, I'm going to steward this revelation. That whatever is required of me, I'm willing to give it to see the manifestation of this thing. Because God, you wouldn't have showed it to me just to show it to me. And God, 
you wouldn't give me the idea to fall in love with the idea and not see the manifestation of it. Some of us got to stop getting happy at the idea of a better life and actually fall in love with the instructions required for a better life. Some of us, all we need is a prophet to tell us that we coming out. And it's sad to say we've been coming out for three years and ain't came out yet (laughs) because we're so in love with the idea of coming out that we've never done what was necessary to actually come out. So as long as you just keep telling me I'm coming out, I'm satisfied. Watch this, Peter. It's good that we're here. I'm I'm glad I came to church so he could tell me I'm coming out. No, 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 no. You got to go from glory, faith to faith, glory to glory. God, I thank you for the glory you revealed that I'm coming out. But God, I need the next glory. What's my plan? Yes, sir. God, I thank you uh, uh, for this moment here. But God, I'm not going to marry the moment and miss the movement. God, I know you have better for somebody. Say, God has better for me. And I'm not settling for anything less. I'm not settling for anything less than what God has promised. How do I responsibly handle God's revelation? Get up. That when God shows you something, it's not for you to move in, it's for you to move on. That I showed you this not to unpack in this moment, but watch this to start packing up for what's to come. We got to get up. Not only do we have to get up, but we got to listen up. Let's stop getting so excited. The prophets say one good thing and we start yelling and now we can't hear the rest of what he's saying. No, 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 no. God, I thank you, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut until you tell me everything that God has for me. And Lord, please don't forget. Shut up. Shut up. Look at your neighbor one more time because I don't want him mad at me. Say, neighbor, that sound good, but shut up. Because if you tell it to the wrong person, you're going to find yourself fighting battles that you never should have fought. Watch this. Some of us have fought our way into revelation when we should have walked into it. And the reason we fought into it is because we opened our mouths to the wrong person. Shut up. And I mean that in love.